As video creators, we have all imagined what it would be like to have one lens that covers everything. Well, what if I told you that that lens may already exist and no one is really giving it the attention I feel it deserves? In this video, we're going to compare it to other lenses that are more expensive and supposedly better and see if it is actually possible to create amazing videos with just one lens. Before we get into the lens I'm referring to, I want to start in a bit of a strange place, but if you just bear with me for one second, this will all make sense by the end and you'll understand why something is not quite adding up to me. Anyone who's been in the video or photo world for the last decade or two and has looked for lenses for mirrorless cameras or DSLRs knows exactly how manufacturers structure their lenses. We have a starter range that is normally represented by minimal branding, plastic hair, they may be like a zoom lens or a kit lens where the f-stop changes and they may be like 150 millimeter that is really plastic and low budget moving into the mid-range the second tier of lenses this is where they introduce some kind of branding for canon they have a silver ring around the end of the lens but for sonet they put the letter g and for Sigma, they put a letter C. For Panasonic, you would see a letter S. And finally, we have the very highest tier, which is the best these manufacturers have to offer. This is normally represented by some really kind of well-known famous branding. You have the Canon L series with the red ring. You have Sony G Master lenses. You have obviously the famous Sigma Art lenses. And finally, Panasonic Lumix's version of this is an S Pro which places a red S on your lens. This is where I'm struggling though. Let's take a G Master lens from Sony, for example. We all know what is the criteria and what makes a G Master lens. It would be like a prime lens with the lowest aperture that Sony can offer you, a 1.4 or even an F1.2. Offering you the best blend of like a max zoom range mixed with a consistent aperture versus the image quality. And these are normally really, really good lenses. But when it comes to Panasonic, this is not quite the case. I'm not sure anymore what actually makes an S Pro lens. Yes, we have like a 50mm with an f1.4 aperture. All the rest of the prime lenses in Panasonic's lineup are all f1.8s, but they are just S lenses and not the S Pros. And finally, the lens I'm referring to today, which is the 24 to 105 f4, is not an S Pro lens, but just an S. So when I received this lens in for testing, my expectations was a mid-tier category. I thought it was gonna have lots of flaws that separated it from being an S-Pro lens, but during my testing, it is much, much more interesting than that. Before we get into my thoughts on this lens, please hit the subscribe button below, because if you love film and video tech, I've got so much content coming for you this year. Now let's get into my experience when testing and shooting with this 24 to 105. So the first thing you experience with any lens is the build quality. Lenses are one of those pieces of equipment that you have an opinion of as soon as you grab it and feel the way and the build quality. I would say that the 24 to 105 pretty much meets expectations, maybe slightly above where I was expecting it to be. It definitely feels like it could be a G Master lens. It's the same materials as Canon's, Sony's and Lumix's own kind of top of the range lens. It is surprisingly small and light when you first pick it up, but that's because it's zoomed into 24mm, more on that later. It is dust and weather sealed, which is always great. And this takes me back onto the question of what makes an S-Pro lens. Comparing it here to my 16-35 Lumix S-Pro lens, it is the same plastics, rubbers, all the materials are the exact same. So there's nothing about the build quality of this lens that justifies it to not be an S Pro. Outside of say sports and wildlife filmmaking, the zoom range on this lens is pretty much everything you could need. You get a 24, 35, 50, 85 and a 105. Other than say a 16mm, that's pretty much a full cine kit. And if that is not enough, you also get built in macro mode when you are at 105mm. Check out this shot I got here while in a gym on a shoot. This is the handle of the weight and I am fully zoomed in at 105mm and I am at minimum focus distance. And to get an idea how versatile this lens actually is, without moving the camera at all, I zoomed out to 24mm 
and captured a shot from that exact same location. This is such a massive perspective difference for me. And finally, the cherry on top of the cake for this lens and taking me on to my next point, this lens is image stabilized. We all know how good, and I've heard how good, the IBIS is inside Lumix cameras at this point. Pairing this lens up with a Lumix camera really takes things to the next level. The results you can get are really something to behold and even at 105 millimeters, you get amazing results. And for me, that is not even the best positive about this lens being IBIS. If you pair this lens up with the new Blackmagic full frame L mount, it almost gives you in-body image stabilization to the Blackmagic. It makes the handheld shots so much more usable. And especially if you want to mix these with the gyro stabilization inside Resolve, you can get pretty good results when handheld in the Blackmagic. You may have noticed already that there is some lens distortion at 24 mm, but it's good to keep in note that when I was shooting on the Lumix S5 II, I was capturing in RAW on the output, and when I was shooting on the Blackmagic, obviously that also captures RAW. If you were to use this lens with the internal codex inside of the S5 II, it would actually remove that lens distortion, and it does a pretty incredible job of doing so. Most hybrid and photography lenses like this 24 to 105 suffer from focus breathing. This is because they are not made for solar video work like say a cine lenses. Their thing is to reduce focus breathing to almost zero. So when you receive a mid tier photography lens, something as a byproduct you would just have to live with is focus breathing. But that said, there is very minimal focus breathing on this lens. I was expecting it to be so much worse than it actually is. Something where focus breathing is really prominent is normally in zoom lenses and photography lenses and cheaper lenses and this kind of ticks all three boxes but at 24mm it's very minimal there is definitely some here and when punching into 105mm there is definitely some more but I would say this is not bad at all and really does compete with some of the best photography lenses out there in terms of focus breathing. To try and find some chromatic aberration on the lens I was taking photos of my test chart and I'm not quite sure if the Lumix was kind of removing chromatic aberration in camera as it is almost too clean for my liking. I definitely feel like this lens should have more chromatic aberration than what I could find in these photos. But I'm showing the photos on screen now, see if you can see any. But for me, it is very, very minimal and I can barely see any at all. But this lens is sharper in the middle than it is at the edges, but that kind of kind of crossbow sharpness is more of a photography thing for me. When it comes to videos, most of the time, we're using kind of film emulation, color grading, lens filters and mist filters. And it is more than sharp enough for say work that would be going to YouTube or Instagram or online. By the time you've rendered it out in 4K in some MP4 or MOV and it's been compressed, the sharpness of this lens is totally fine. The out of focus sections on this lens are very natural and pleasing. Again, they really fit with kind of like the modern looking lenses we have been getting over the last five or 10 years. Lens flares are something that's a little bit more interesting though. Like most modern lenses, they are hard to find. They don't come into shot accidentally, but when pointing into a direct light source, like a spotlight or the sun, they are definitely there. You have lots of different sections to the flare, and it's really gonna be personal preference whether you like this or not. I actually like the fact that there's a bit of character and personality in this lens if you wanna find something a bit interesting when shooting. Although it's not my favorite flare I've ever seen, it's definitely not my least favorite either. I did do some testing with the autofocus on my S5 II, comparing to an S-Pro lens and a Sigma Art lens, and the autofocus is as good as any L-mount lens gets. Like most photography L-mount lenses, it is focused by wire. If you're using this with an S5 II and going into a manual focus, there's a setting in the camera that lets you place it as linear, what makes it behave a lot better. If you're filming on a Blackmagic, you are a bit out of luck here and it is focused by wire. But what I will say is, it's nowhere near as bad as say the 50mm 1.4, which suffers from really inconsistent focus. This lens is very close to kind of like the normal non focus by wire photography lenses. It's far from any cine lens with a big throw and super smooth like that, but it's also far from being the worst focus by wire lens that exists. Right, next up, I'm going to compare the image quality out of this 24 to 105 to some more expensive lenses that should perform better than it. Just before that, I want to tell you about my brand new guide. If you own a Panasonic S5 II or S5 II X, 
Over the last few months, I have been working super hard just for you. This guide makes it easy and achievable to get the best possible quality out of your S5 II. It's over two and a half hours worth of content broken down into 13 different sections. From setting up your camera settings, custom menus and custom buttons, all the way to autofocus, IBIS, exposure, and I even go over real world setups and shooting scenarios. This guide also gets you access to our S5 II community, which I am always in every day. And there is a lot of other S5 II owners that can help you with any questions and problems that you want to know the answers to. So if you're interested, the link's in the description to find out more information about that. Now let's get back into comparing the lenses. First up, I want to compare it to one of my favorite Panasonic Lumix lenses. This is the 16 to 35 S Pro F4. Both lenses here are at 24 millimeter, wide open at their F4 apertures. As you can see here, I don't think any one of these images jumps out over the other one. The 24 to 105 definitely has more lens distortion at 24 millimeters, but I'm capturing in RAW here. If you capture it internally on an S5 II, it will correct most all of that distortion. In terms of color rendering, they are very similar. Same with sharpness. I think 99% of people would never even be able to tell the difference between these two lenses. Next, I wanna compare it to a super popular lens that I see a lot of people using, and this is the Sigma R 24-70 f2.8. Again, both at 24 millimeters here, both with wide open apertures, so we have f4 and f2.8. First thing you're going to see here is that you get more background separation with the f2.8 aperture on the Sigma, which is nice. But personally, I think the colors and skin tones are way better here out of the Panasonic lens. Again, there is a little bit more lens distortion here on the Lumix. I struggle to pick a favorite image here as I love the extra depth of the Sigma, but I also love the colors on the Panasonic. Same lens settings again, but now we are at 50 millimeter on both lenses. You can see the background is brighter on the Sigma, as I was only turning up the key light to match my face in exposure. The background here looks a lot more closer and a lot more blurry on the 24 to 105, as the more you zoom in, the more depth you get in your image. We are now at 70 millimeters on both lenses. This is maxed out for the Sigma. It's more of the same here. There is more blur on the background of the Sigma, but the skin tones are better on the Lumix. Here, I wanted to show both max zoom ranges. So we are at 105 millimeters on the Lumix, and 70 millimeters on the Sigma. This evens out that F2.8 versus F4 background blur issue here. Pretty much the same depth, but it feels much more compressed at 105 millimeter on the Lumix. As with anything in life, there is always good and bad. So let's talk about some negatives. It almost doubles in size when going from 24 mil to 105 mil. But something to note here is the 24 to 70 Sigma art lens does pretty much the exact same thing, but just with less zoom range. But this is just a negative for both lenses in my eyes. Something else that is not really a negative is what I touched on before with the flares. Some people like their lenses to just have the minimal amount of flares that you can get. And I guess this lens is not that. If you shine directly into a light source, there is visible flares. I don't know whether this one is a justified negative, but maybe the F4 aperture. I'm sure people love the 24 to 105 F2.8 like Canon have just released, but you've got to think of the sacrifices you would make to get that. It would weigh twice as much and probably be even bigger than it already is. And I don't know if it's just the way I shoot, but I get most of my background blur from the way I position people and objects, not necessarily lowering my aperture. And cameras are getting so good in low light nowadays. Do you even need that extra stop of light between it? But I thought I would add it in here just as food for thought. And the last two is focus by wire, which I already mentioned. And it's pretty harsh as most of its competition also has focus by wire and is more expensive. And secondly is no f-stop on the lens, which again falls pretty much into the same category. Most zoom lenses that are photography lenses don't really have the f-stop on the lens. A lot of prime lenses do, but I'm not seeing it much in the zoom category. This lens really beat my expectations and really has me asking the question, what makes a Panasonic S Pro lens? I guess we'll just have to wait and see what new lenses Panasonic bring out in the future, and this should hopefully all make sense. In the meantime, 
I've been watching big Hollywood productions and trying to copy them into my own small little filmmaking productions. Some of those things have worked amazingly. Find out what they are right here.